I mean, honestly, this is the toughest part of the job. I do not enjoy it, but I, I've always said it's better to just rip off the bandaid, you know? So, gotta do it. It's kind of done. Look, I meant it when I said that I loved you. Um, you've been amazing. We've had some incredible times together, but I feel like you knew what you were getting into uh, when we got together. And I'm just gonna come right out and say it. I need to see other TVs. Um, I, I know, it's hard. It's hard for me too, but it's, it's kind of part of the, the deal. And look, you know, this isn't the end. Like there will be more good times. We'll, we'll be back together. Maybe even the best is yet to come. I don't know yet, but I, I just, I gotta get out there so that I can know, you know? <laughs>
that's where the one connect cable goes in. You can see that it is a super shallow area, but that's so that you can get a nice flush wall mount um, with I'm sure Samsung's custom wall mount that you have to purchase separately. And then you notice that there are four transducers on either side of the stand. Um, they don't have a whole lot of excursion, um, which is why there's more of them since they can't move a whole lot, very thin panel. They add more of them so that they can enhance the base response. And I also can't help but notice these vent holes here. Um, I think there might be speakers back there. I didn't get that. Shut up, Siri. Yeah, I believe there are some transducers back there as well. But for now, let's get this thing hooked up so that we can uh, have a good look at it. By the way, there is a shorter uh, One Connect cable if you're mounting the One Connect box to the back of the TV stand. We will be using uh, the more traditional cable, which, yeah, is thick. This used to be a super thin fiber optic cable, but now it carries power, and uh, I actually prefer it that way. That reminds me of Wonder Woman's lasso. I don't know why, but when I was a kid, mesmerized. Don't ask me why. I might've been trying to do that backwards. Okay, there we go. We're done. We're done. We're turning this around now. We're almost there. So I can't help but they had these uh, little rubber bumpers down at the corners and I can't help but wonder if that's to protect it in shipment. There were some complaints of the, a little bit of deformity on the frame of the TV. Um, last year, so that might be them trying to uh, address that issue. And then, yeah, there's a fair amount of plastic to pull off here. So I guess we'll start at the border and work our way around. These panels are so hard to clean um, that I can't help but wonder, is there plastic here or? I'm gonna reach out to Samsung and make sure that there is indeed film on this TV that I should be pulling off. I'm not gonna make any mistakes and hopefully whatever I find out is gonna be of value to folks who get this TV. We'll be back with the full review uh, when you see me next. Okay guys, so here's the deal. Obviously it's been a few days since we unboxed the TV. I'm sure you can tell I look a little bit different. It's the Botox injections, takes days off my appearance. Anyway, it turns out the weird stuff I saw on the screen was some kind of damage. I thought maybe there was some film I hadn't figured out how to remove. Nope, it was definitely the screen. Kind of looked like something had rubbed off in certain areas. I don't think you need to worry about this happening to you. I believe what I experienced was a byproduct of that TV having been a well-used sample. Probably saw a lot of shipping action. It's made the rounds, if you know what I mean. So I got a replacement from Samsung in a hurry, and this one is pristine. I've had plenty of time to test and watch it, and honestly, I could probably make this a 45 second review, but where's the fun in that? So you ready to dig in? I hope so, because here we go. Okay, some non-picture quality stuff first. Despite having experienced a little frustration assembling the TV, I'm gonna say the added effort is worth it because I really like this pedestal stand. It's robust, stable, high quality, and it leaves ample space below the bottom of the TV for a sound bar, which is important because this TV deserves at least one of those. The stand also acts as a holding bay for the One Connect box, which I'm happy to see has escaped the confines of Samsung's 8K QLED tier. I'm a fan of the One Connect box, as you may recall from prior Samsung TV reviews, and I think this is the best implementation of it so far. I know custom installers don't care for it, but for those of you installing your own TVs, whether on a stand or wall mounted, the ability to house all connections separately and run one cable, which includes power by the way, to the TV, is user friendly in a way that I just wish more TVs were. You like to swap out gear often? This arrangement makes it super easy. Since we're talking about the One Connect box, this is a good time to mention that this TV will pass through Dolby Atmos Audio via the eARC HDMI port. It does not, however, support DTS pass-through, which is unfortunate because DTS is the default audio format on many Blu-rays. So if you want the best sound from your Blu-ray player and you're not rocking Dolby Atmos, you'll need to run through your audio device first, then to the TV. I just, you know what? I don't understand why no DTS support. The S95C also has an ATSC 3.0, aka Next Gen Tuner in it for over-the-air broadcast, which is good in that it's future-proofed for the latest broadcast standards, but much to the chagrin of the interest group that pushes ATSC 
I have yet to see any real benefits come through. I think we'll get there eventually though. As for Tizen, Samsung Smart TV OS, look, let me just be clear about a personal bias I have here. I prefer Google TV and Apple TV OS, and I still think Roku is a solid choice for a lot of folks. I am not, however, a big fan of Samsung's Tizen or LG's WebOS. Tizen is now better than it was before, and I appreciate that a lot of work has gone into it, but it tries to do too much. It feels unnecessarily complicated. The TV is also sluggish at times, I think, because of Tizen. I will make one exception here though, and that's for Samsung's Cloud Gaming Hub, which I think is of legit value to anyone who is ready to give up on consoles and just game from the cloud. Anyway, if I own this TV, I'm personally gonna use up one of my HDMI ports by plugging in a Chromecast with Google TV. That's just me, you do you. Speaking of HDMI ports, you get four full bandwidth HDMI 2.1 ports, so no limitations there, which is great news for gamers who wanna get the most out of their next gen console. There's no support for Dolby Vision, be it for games, streaming, or disc playback though. And so long as I'm talking about gaming, I'll mention that this TV does a great job of auto-labeling all game systems, lots of different uh, devices that you might connect to it actually, and it goes into low latency gaming mode automatically, offers a comprehensive gaming dashboard too. The TV also supports VRR and it goes up to 144 Hertz, all while maintaining an input lag right around nine milliseconds. Now I'll get into gaming picture quality a bit in a moment, but from a gaming feature standpoint, this TV is loaded. Now it's time to get into picture quality and I'm gonna go ahead and issue a hot take right now. The Samsung S95C is the best TV Samsung has ever made, period. When trying to explain to my 14 year old daughter why I was so into this particular TV, I just told her it's bussin'. I said, anyone whose living room is in need of a glow up needs to check out this TV. It was then that I was promptly kicked out of my own house for being chuggy, only to be allowed back in on the condition that I buy one of these TVs so that she can have the old TV it's two years old, in her room. The old TV, by the way, is 75 inches. I'll let you know how that all turns out. Anyway, as far as I'm concerned, this is Samsung's real 2023 flagship TV. Funny enough though, Samsung doesn't agree with me. Stick around for the end of the video and I'll explain that little bit of inside baseball a bit more. For now, let's talk about why this is the best TV Samsung has ever made. Let's go back one year. Samsung's S95B QD OLED was an amazing TV, a real turning point for Samsung in my opinion. Ironically, that TV almost didn't get made. I'm glad it did though, because it was wildly popular. And so Samsung Electronics decided to expand the line. This year, not only are there two tiers of QD OLED, the S95C and the S90C, but there is also a 77 inch screen size, which not gonna lie, kinda wish was here right now. Perhaps more importantly though, Samsung Electronics has used Samsung Display's newest QD OLED panels for these TVs. And one of several benefits of this new panel is that it allows this new QD OLED model to get significantly brighter than the first gen of this technology. And since we're going to dive into measurements, I guess that means we've arrived at the numbers for Knit Nerd segment of my review, which is skippable, time codes in the description, but I wouldn't recommend it this time. As a reminder, the S95B last year peaked at 1000 nits of pure white brightness. This TV peaks at just shy of 1600 nits. That's just shy of a 60% increase in brightness. Now that is notably higher than the measured peak brightness results some other YouTubers and publications are getting, which could mean a few things. It could mean that this is a so-called golden sample, which I wouldn't put past Samsung for trying to give me, but I mean, Samsung turned around the shipment on this replacement TV so fast that it would have had to have been pre-vetted. It's possible, but it's also possible I just got lucky with the quality of the sample I got. But to be clear, I tested this TV after it had been running for quite some time in a 70 degree Fahrenheit room. And I mentioned that because it's true that as this TV warms up, it'll throttle back the peak brightness a bit to protect it. Still, even after I adjusted the grayscale on this TV and it had been running for hours, I got 1560 nits at multiple window sizes in HDR filmmaker mode. I tried all the window sizes and it was tracking that the whole time. 
In SDR filmmaker mode, I got 250 nits, which you would expect. But if you venture outside of filmmaker mode to a brighter picture mode, you can easily get 600 nits. Full screen will still tap out at about 250 nits though. The point is, this TV does a great job combating glare and ambient brightness. Were it not for the slightly purplish tint to the screen when you hit it with direct light, emphasis on direct, then I'd say this is as good a bright room TV as just about anything else. But you do lose just a tiny bit of the deep blacks when you fire like a light cannon at this thing. So if you do that a lot, well, OLED probably isn't for you anyway. But the peak white brightness isn't the real story with this TV. No, it's the peak color luminance. And in that regard, QD OLED is coming up aces. I measured very impressive color brightness levels with little sacrifice to accuracy. My point is this TV doesn't just have a lot of general brightness punch. It has very specific color brightness, which gives it this super vivid vibe that when combined with OLED's perfect blacks is simply unmatched by any other TV technology. It's just, it's a treat for the eyes. Now to wrap up the numbers for Nit Nerd section, let me just say that this TV in its unaltered filmmaker modes, both SDR and HDR, came up with very impressive, accurate results. Except for the very brightest whites and two oddly specific color shades, everything tested under a delta error of three, which means that these are errors that can only be measured with equipment, not seen with your eyes. Perhaps it is a golden sample, but it shows that this TV is very capable of being calibrated to near perfection. So we have excellent white brightness, excellent color brightness, excellent color saturation, excellent color volume, 100% of P3 color space, and 75% of BT2020, perfect black levels, very good shadow detail. What else is there to love about this TV? Well, its processing is also very impressive. Virtually no color banding. Motion is solid, even without any motion smoothing turned on. If you have to have it, there is a black frame insertion feature, but you know, I'm no fan of BFI. I mean, this TV is just ticking off all the boxes. I watched a lot of movies on this TV. I went back to Marvel's Infinity War and Endgame, and both just looked outstanding start to finish. And while I was on Disney+, Plus, I also checked out Multiverse of Madness. Now this is a flick that is rife with made up colors. The opening sequence contains colors that only exist in the dark corners of the multiverse, I imagine. And I've seen lesser TV struggle to pull off the intense hues of red, purple, and blue in a way that didn't just look faked or strained. Granted, as viewed on the S95C, you're not getting Dolby Vision, but I have to say, I didn't feel like I was missing much or anything. This scene just dazzles right to the very end. And then when Strange wakes up in the library, I mean his bedroom, look at the shine on the books in the bookcase. Just gorgeous. Of course, I also had to pull out the Spears and Munsell disc because are you even a TV reviewer if you don't? That question is preposterous, but I did it anyway because there are some telltale scenes here and the S95C passed them with all the flying colors. It was also with the Spears and Munsell that I toggled back and forth between the TV's active and static HDR tone mapping options. Now, the static option means that the TV is reproducing HDR as the creators intended. And this was a needed ad by Samsung. While the active setting let Samsung do its thing where it over brightens images, abandoning technical accuracy for a presentation that's based on what Samsung thinks most folks will like. And if you like Zing, the active mode will definitely deliver. You get a brighter overall picture, but HDR highlights still stand out pretty well. I'm not here to judge what you like best. I just wanted to report that you have the options that you want with this TV. Even basic 720p TV looked pretty good, which is mostly a testament to the S95C's excellent color brightness and perfect blacks, but it's also a reflection of Samsung's constantly improved processing, which cleans up nasty cable and satellite TV signals pretty well these days. Really, I mean, is there anything that is not awesome about this TV? Well, no, not really, not for most folks. I suppose I could complain that as accurate as it is otherwise, the TV does tend to over brighten things in game mode. But generally, this TV offers a gorgeous gaming experience. I will complain about there being no Dolby Vision support, but that will come as no surprise to those of us who follow Samsung's stubbornness. 
I'm also a little perplexed that this TV doesn't sound great on its own when there is literally an array of bass transducers lining the back. So that gets the big shrug emoji. I will say that the amplify sound mode helped fatten things up a bit, but still, Get an audio system that provides sound as good as the picture. Samsung's soundbars are actually a solid choice. Otherwise, folks, this TV is just exemplary and it comes in a 77 incher now. I mean, if you want one of the best TVs you can buy, this is definitely one of three. This is, I'm sure of it, going to be one of my top three picks this year. I think it's gonna be the LG G3, the Sony A95L, though I have yet to test it, and then here, the Samsung S95C. This TV is a treat. Much love. Honestly, the only reasons you should not buy this TV, other than the fact that it is pretty expensive, is if you constantly watch in a totally sun-drenched room or like to point studio lights at your TV while watching for some oddball reason, or feel like not having Dolby Vision is a non-starter, or watch lots of sports channels or other channels with static elements for five to six hours a day, every day, without fail, hashtag burn in. By the way, I've got a video on that. Those really are the only reasons not to buy this TV. Otherwise, get it, it is superb. Here's the thing though, it could be better. This is me delivering on that tease from earlier in the video. I think this TV is being intentionally held back by Samsung. I know for a fact that Samsung Display designed the panel so that it could peak at almost 2000 nits. This TV is not meeting its full potential. But why would Samsung hold it back? Honestly, I can only theorize. I mean, this whole thing is just a theory anyway, but I will say that Samsung doesn't view this TV as its flagship model. It's still pushing its 8K QLED line hard, and it is quite proud of its top tier 4K QLED, the QN95C as well. So long as the S95C here isn't the flagship, then it can't be throwing shade at other TVs in Samsung's own lineup. So. I think its performance has been reined in just enough so that it doesn't just stomp on those top tier QLEDs. That's just a theory. Like I said, I could be wrong. I suppose we'll find out later this year when the Sony A95L comes out. Until then, I'm going to enjoy this S95C for as long as I can. I don't wanna let this TV go. It's just such a joy to watch. Thanks as always for watching everyone. What do you think of my S95C review? Leave me a comment down below. Click that like button if you liked it. Next stop is a direct comparison to the LG G3, so subscribe so you don't miss that. I'll see you in the next video, and until then, here's two other videos I think you might like.